Let me start. I'll be greedy and ask a few myself. Sure. I was very excited about agreeing with the Knight Foundation, which we readily did, to give you this award because you've done a lot of things. You brought a voice back to television <laughs> news. To you brought innovation and breaking of orthodoxies to TV news, which I think it badly needs, and not just TV, but other areas as well. Uh, I know that you're very proud of bringing new voices from around the world to exposure and, and to be heard. And then finally, you've proven that young people give a shit about their world, mm. which no one thought was the case. So I want to ask you just a few questions about those things. First, the voice of Vice. Mm. It's human. It cares. What makes Vice's voice Vice's voice? Well, <clears throat> I think that, first of all, um, we came up as documentary filmmakers. So we look at it from a documentary filmmaking standpoint. What does that mean? It means a lot of times you can go to Afghanistan, and the story is one thing one week, and it changes by the time you get there, and then it changes again by the time you leave. Um, I think that news, you know, there's a fire at City Hall, Jimmy, get me two pictures, you know, that tries to shoehorn some things in, and whereas in a documentary filmmaking, we weren't tied to anything. We were more like, when we get there, it could be, it could be this, or it could be this, or if we went off into this uh, story, then we go off on that story, A. B, I think that, you know, we, we, we gave our company over to the interns in that, you know, young people are disenfranchised and they feel disenfranchised and, and they're angry. And um, they like to see their, their people on, uh, and, and, and by the way, our, my favorite of our unlikely stars is Thomas Morton, who's 98 pounds soaking wet, bad acne, terrible dandruff, <laughs> socially <laughs> awkward. And, um, and he's a fantastic, because everyone can relate to him. Or, you know, uh, uh, he, if he's doing that, I can do that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, his stories are very heartfelt. Um, and I think that, you know, we're not perfect. We show our, our ass warts and all. Um, and, and I think that there's a resonance there as well. And I think that there's a, there's a you know, when we first started, we got criticized a lot for what we were wearing or how we were talking. And I was like, well, if that, the only thing they can get us on is our style, then we're okay. But what, what they were saying is, you don't dress like us. You don't look like us. You don't talk like us. And that turned out to be a great thing because we have resonance with our demo, whereas traditional media, except in the New York Times, doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I, and I think, look, there's a changing of the guard every generation in media. And that's happening now. And Vice is the changing of the guard. And, and because of the dialogue, because of the way we talk, because of the way we shoot, because of the way we cut, you know. And that's why mainstream media is having a hard time doing online video, is because you have to rip out all the pipes and literally give your company over to the interns, which no one's willing to do. So relevant to us as a journalism school, relevant to this very generous, and thank you very much, uh, 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 Grant, for, for, for a new fund here, how do you find these talents? How do you, where, where do you find them? What screams out to you when you meet them that they're right for vice? And then how do you train them? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, so we, when we started, we didn't have any money. And um, so we would go to the tech schools and say, give us your best shooter and your best cutter. And they liked that, the deans like that, because they get jobs for their kids. And we liked it because we get technically proficient um, people. Uh, that we would then put through another school, a storytelling school run by Spike Jones, who's our creative director. And so what happened is we developed, you know, our, our greatest asset was our ignorance, you know, because we developed our own style, we developed our own way of shooting, our own way of cutting. And, you know, that has sort of gone forward in that we have about 5,000 contributors around the world. And when we see someone we like, we can pull them into full time. A. B, we also have a new facility we're just, uh, that's just going online now in Q1, which is a teaching school, so all of our people from around the world can come in, see how we shoot, see how we cut, because we do it completely differently than most other organizations. So we actually are the, you know, we're, we're, when anybody wants to set up video, they generally say, let's hire someone from TV or film or commercials, God help you. And for us, only because they get three million bucks to do 30 seconds. Right? <laughs> Three million bucks for us is like 3,000 hours. So for, for, for us, it's, it's really important that we have people that are not corrupted. And then they go through our, our system 
and they learn how we, we do things. And I think that's another reason why we have resonance, because you know, we're speaking the same way as, as the actual audience. What does it mean to teach them journalism? What, what, is that, what does even journalism mean to you and device? That's a good question, too. Uh, it, I think if you ask 500 people advice, what it meant, you'd get 500 different answers. Personally, you know, I'm, I don't believe you can be objective. Um, when I go to Congo or when I go to Afghanistan, I have a reaction because of where I've come from and, and how I've lived my life. Um, and, you know, stories do affect me. Um, and I believe that passion, someone asked me the other day what makes a good uh, investiga investigative journalist, and I said, you know, passion, number one, tenacity, uh, number two, and, and sort of thriving off pressure. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, you don't need to go to journalism school, although it's better if you do. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to feel passionate about these things, and you have to want to fix things as well. You know, my wife always laughs at me because when we go to the airport, I'm like, but it's not right. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. And I think, you know, you have to want to fix things and say, hey, that's wrong. We should, we should be trying to fix that, be it environmentally or politically or, you That's know. an interesting parallel. We had Bill Gross here earlier who started 125 companies. And, and, and the root of his new companies is, that's wrong, I want to fix that. Yeah. And so you bring entrepreneurship or journalism or media to that, which becomes interesting. Yeah. Talk about the business that we're in, right? All our, our wonderful old hallowed halls yeah. uh, are having trouble. You've gotten how much investment? Some. Some. Um, so you can do new things with it because you're growing and, 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 and you're going somewhere. So what, what about the business of news and journalism and informing society? Where do you see that going? Well, the good news is the audience has never been bigger. And there's never been more money out there in the system. Um, but it is problematic because nowadays you have to be good at pretty much everything, which means being good at, um, you know, helping brands get to where they want to be, good at making content, good at platform, good at socials, good at tech, good at all these things. And generally, in back in the day, you could do one thing well. And now, those days are over. Um, so so that's, that's one thing. Um, you know, the other thing is the audience has migrated. Everyone's like, can TV move to online? Well, if that's the question, you're already dead because it's already mobile. And so, you know, if you don't have mobile strategies, then, then you're in real trouble. Um, the other problem that a lot of media companies have is that they give their um, monetization to other people because it's hard. So they say, well, I'll let YouTube monetize for me. I'll let you know, this ad network monetize for me. I'll sub out my, my, my sales. That's the stupid, you've just lost control of your company and you're gone. <laughs> and I think that now, that's, but it's hard. It's hard to go out there and, and set up that division. But if you don't, then, then you're in trouble. And what I always tell my people is, you know, if you, if you say you don't want money or advertising, if you say you hate money, then it means you hate content. Because it takes money to make content. The New York Times needs money, Washington Post needs money, you know, everybody needs money to make content. And if you don't have money to make content, someone else will get it, and they'll make content that's worse than yours. So we have to win on the money side, and we have to win on the content side. And that's the new paradigm, and that's the paradigm that people are wrestling with. You mentioned helping brands, which, these days translates as native advertising. Where, where do you see the lines in how we have to operate with credibility, but also making the money to make the journalism and make the content? Uh, how, how do you see that operating as advice for the industry? Well, I think a couple of things. I think that a lot is being made out of this, where if you look back at the history of newspapers, radio, television, magazines, they've all been funded by advertising forever. So nothing's changed. I think that if on the positive side, if you look at native, you say, well, if the people making the media make the actual activation around that media, that makes sense because spots and dots that are supposed to be universal don't work. Um, display doesn't work. Pre-roll pretty much doesn't work. So what are you going to do? You have to make bespoke assets. And I think that's just smart. It, it, it works better. Um, you know, the problem is, is where's the line? <clears throat> Actually, ironically, we're going back to media pre-Spots and Dots. So we're going to when it was Calgon sponsors only the Shadow Nose, but it could be Chesterfields. It could, it's, you're going to make only the Shadow Nose anyway. You just want to find a brand that 
that, that, that works with it. So, for example, with the Creators Project, you know, Intel wanted to get close to arts and creativity, so they become a producer. They give us money, and we make the thing. You know, they don't give us notes. We just make what we want to make, and they, they get the brand lift from that because the consumer is incredibly savvy. They don't need to be hit over the head with bong, 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 you know. They, they, oh, I like Spike Jones. You gave me a phone by Spike Jones. I get it. That's all you need. So I think, you know, now brands are getting smart enough that they realize that, and they realize that earned media is much more important than bought media, which is another problem that traditional media has, because they've just been sitting there going, well, I get 3% more year on year just because they have to buy more. And now the, the largest migration of money is going into earned media, and unless you can adapt. Selling eyeballs by volume, as I said earlier, is not going to make our future. Selling eyeballs by volume, but just selling shotgun advertising, right. it's not going to work. Uh, some people say that you're the next Ted Turner with a nicer accent. Uh -huh. um, do you want a television network, and if so, why? Um, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, because when, when you were talking about being platform agnostic, everyone says, everyone says, well, you're platform agnostic, but why in God's name do TV? Um, <laughs> and I think that what the HBO show taught us was there was a whole audience out there. Well, to go back, when we, we had our O&O platforms, we did the YouTube um, experiment with original uh, channels. And um, we, 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 our, our audience grew. It, it, it didn't cannibalize. So there's a whole audience out there that we didn't have. And if you look at Kansas City, people get off at 5 and they home at 5.30 and they finish their dinner by 5.45 and they proceed to watch six hours of TV. It's a huge audience that isn't a traditional Vice audience, A. B, if you look at a lot of countries where in an internet penetration isn't where it is here, you have TV as a massive um, uh, um, audience. So for example, we're, we're about to do a deal now where we had 600 million homes terrestrially, right? And that's a massive scale, but it's also huge margin for the company because in a lot of cases we've already made that for online. But, fine, but I'll do, I'll do the but for a second, then we'll, then we'll come sure. out here. But, 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 but Al Gore thought he was going to do something different with current, and he got ruined by being by the MSOs. Yeah. Uh, Al Jazeera uh, America thinks it was going to do something different, and it kind of got ruined by having to be with the MSOs. Yeah. How do you keep TV's orthodoxy and 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 the business of the old way from ruining the vice voice and brand? Well, that's a great question. I think the question to go back to answer your first question is: Are you going to transfer your business model to TV? The answer is no. The answer is we're mobile first, online second, TV third. But there are three prongs to the stool. And if you reduce your mission statement down to what do you really want to do, mm -hmm. we want to increase our audience, increase our money, and make shit that is less shit than everybody else's. Right? <laughs> That's our mission statement. Put that on the wall, yeah. And so, <clears throat> so what you need, by the way, one and two to be cranking to, to make three happen. So for us, when we looked at it, we said, actually, to increase our audience exponentially into a new audience and to make a lot of money at the same time, which will then pay for mobile. Because if anyone tells you that they've got mobile cracked, they don't, right? Because we're further along than most people, and we don't. So I mean, maybe Facebook, but you know, they're, they're doing a lot of experiments, and we're doing it with them. So mobile is, 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 is number one. However, there's still a lot of money. I mean, ABI is one of our biggest clients. And they said, boy, we're going to give you a lot of money this year. We give you 5x that if you had TV. So oh, bing, you know, and also, we're sold out for the next eight months. We doubled our rate card twice this year. And we're still sold out for eight months on all of our digital platforms, including YouTube, which we sell at the same amount as our own up. So we're, to get assets for advertising, we actually need to buy TV. Uh, but I also think if you look at the content creation, we look at it as a content creation hub. If you have a studio that's cranking out all this stuff, and if it's good, you can export it internationally to mobile in India, online in Brazil, TV in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it increases your audience exponentially and makes more money. So why wouldn't you do it? Questions? Don.
I'd be curious to what you think the, uh, or if you think there's a distinction between community and audience, and uh, maybe more specifically, how do you feel your original community um, is uh, relates to your existing community or audience, or, or does it? Wow, that's a good question too. By good, I mean hard. <laughs> um, well, Cool, by definition, is small. And we were cool for a long time. And we were niche for a long time. So we got a get out of jail free card. We were everyone's kid brother. We weren't any, eating anybody's lunch. So we were, oh, vice, they're fine, they're OK. And when Gen Y went from niche to general media, vice grew. I mean, everyone's like, why is vice growing? Well, our audience is growing. And our audience not only is growing, it's gaining economic and political power. And by the way, they're, they don't watch traditional TV, so no one knows where to find them. So the initial community is funny because it's like when I was a kid and I, there was like five punk rockers in Ottawa, Canada, where I grew up. And when I went to Montreal, there was 250 and was like, oh my god, we're taking over. It's the, we own the world. And you know, we go see a band like Pavement and 80 people would be at that Pavement show, right? But now if you go see Pavement, it's 25,000 people because all the kid brothers and sisters of the Gen Xers, they're a, a seminal sort of, you know, so they, they, they grew up with them. So now they've become exponentially bigger. So Vice, which was this cute little thing for the older brothers and sisters, the Gen Xers, all of a sudden blew up online and became mass media for Gen Y. So what Vice means to a 20-year-old is completely different than the hipster's Bible what it means to a 35 or 40 year old. And so I think what's interesting actually is if you see Vice News versus Vice, now people are saying, what the hell is all this poo poo cack and the bum bums? I want ISIS, I want. So now what's happening is that they want more news and less of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff. So I think that that's going to be interesting going forward in that, you know, in seven months. Vice has been rebranded by our audience. Do you feel like meaning is lost? Meaning? No, I think it's gained. I think we didn't have a ton of meaning for a decade there because there was a lot of cocaine flowing around. <laughs> um, I, think, I think, look, I think Vice, our employees and our partners have kind of grown up a little bit and said, uh, if we, if we don't start saying some of this stuff. I mean, I get attacked every time I do environmental uh, uh, content because there's a, there's a, they've done a study and if you have five negative comments, the first, then they perceive it negative. So if you ever notice any news thing we'll do, it's about 90% positive comments and people, and if we do anything environmental, it'll have 100 times the comments and they'll all start negative and then there'll be a huge debate and they'll all go crazy because these people are paid to go in and blog and say, no, it's not true, it's not, it's not warming, it's no sea level rise, it's fine. And so I think you know, what, what happens there is you get people digging in and saying, no, now we really have to do this stuff. Because it, it's easy just to say, well, I, they're going to sling shit at me, I'm just going to leave and go drink beer on the beach. But I think you know, the people who work at Vice now, who used to be very hedonistic, and let's just live in New York City and it's amazing. Now they're saying, okay, well, what's happening in, you know, the West Antarctic ice sheet is, 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 is monumentally important, yet no one's talking about it. And I think that that's the resonance with the audience as well, is they realize that the bill's not in the mail, but that it's been delivered, and they're waiting for payment, and Gen Y is going to have to pay that bill, and they're saying, get out of our way. You had your shot, and you fucked it up, so it's our time now, and we're the voice of that anger. Barbara Rabb, former NBC, Andrew Hayward, former CBS, either or both of you, ah, do you see your old, sorry, Barbara, yeah, you see her. <coughs> Andrew's right here, same row. Do they know that they're, you're just giving them a question? They don't even ask one. No, they didn't ask one. Oh. I'm putting them on the spot. All right, all right. Jeff, I'll ask a question. Well, okay. Shane, how are you? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as you, uh, expand to Vice News, do you expect to become 
a general news organization. I don't mean in terms of your sensibility, but in terms of the breadth of content that you cover. That strikes me as challenging. As, as you said, you started as a magazine, and even now, it's essentially a magazine mentality. I say that as a, as a compliment, meaning you pick and choose the stories where you feel you can make the biggest difference. Do you expect to evolve to a place where the generation that you're appealing to, as you describe it, is going to be looking to you for news coverage, period, of the royals, of the economy, of everything that's on the news now? Yeah, well, I would, I would say no uh, when we started because we didn't want to follow the news cycle. We wanted to do stuff that we were interested in. We believe there's a huge white space for things that aren't reported um, in the news cycle or before the news cycle or after the news cycle. I mean, the war ended in Iraq and everyone said, oh, no more news here. <laughs> and, you know, we went there and, and saw the rise of ISIS and there obviously is news there. And, and other tragic stories like the use of de depleted uranium munitions irradiating Fallujah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's how we started, um, that we would do our style of news. What ended up happening was that we were in a lot of the hot spots where things took off. So we were doing, you know, uh, uh, live streaming. Um, I think Tim Pool's here. Um, the first uh, ever live stream was Google Glass, where he was doing stuff off his phone, Ferguson, in Taxim Square, Tahrir Square. Um, so what ended up happening is we were in the places anyway. Uh, and so we started doing news cycle stuff, before news cycle stuff, off news cycle stuff, and news cycle stuff. So we started doing more and more and more and more. And what's happening now is, because we did our news show in France that did so well, and the news show in Italy that did so well, we're doing more and more news shows, so we're getting even more stuff. Like we, the, the problem now is we're getting too much content coming in. We were supposed to do 70 posts a day, and now we're doing something like 480 posts a day. And that's going to increase as we, as we go uh, more and more internationally. The, the, what we don't want to get into is the CNN uh, problem of we're going to do 24 hours of programming. Where's the jet? Where's the jet? Where's yeah, the jet? which is fine if you have a prolonged war for 10 years, but not fine if you're manufacturing. Well, it, but it, it is the corruption of having to fill a clock. Yeah. You don't have to fill a clock now. Correct. You can do what you freaking want to do and not do yeah, the rest. Yeah, and, and, and I think the question is, are you ever going to fill a clock? And my answer is, we already fill a clock. We just fill it with a lot of stuff, rather than we're not going to be beholden to the traditional North American news cycle. Barbara? Uh, I'm not sure. Just speak. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, or maybe it's for both of you to comment on. But I was struck when you said before that, uh, you know, we'd pay you 5x if you had TV. That's a really different motivation than anything else that I understand about why Vice does what it does and when Vice did what it did. And so this is partly, I'd like to ask you to talk about that. And also, kind of a question to Jeff. That sounded to me like not ask. That sounded like asking the the community you're asking to tell you what they want becomes the ad community, and not what we might call, you know, the viewers, the audience, sure. the people the formerly known as the audience. Yeah. And so I just wanted you to comment on that. That really jumped out at me. That that your motivation there was purely about the. Add dollars. Well, you took the part you liked, but I also <laughs> no, no, said, no. I mean, I it just said it an audience that we didn't traditionally get. Look, you're right, but it's three prongs. Again, it goes back to the three prongs, which is you have to make money. If you don't make money, you don't make content. You have to build audience, right? And then you have to make stuff that people like. And to make stuff that people like, you have to have audience and you have to have money. So TV for us is again, to go back to being platform agnostic, is a huge audience that we don't currently have, not just in America, but globally, because terrestrial is a big thing globally. Um, a, there is a lot of money there to be milked that, that, that has been milked by you guys for a long time. And for us, it's also a content creation hub where we can make stuff that then goes to mobile or to online or to anything else, paid for by terrestrial, where the budgets are still bigger. Terrestrial budgets are much bigger for content creation than mobile, for example, right? Okay. So is it a, a, a way of getting more money? Yes. Is it a way of getting a bigger audience? Yes. And is it, is it a way to make more stuff? Yes. So it satisfies all three prongs of my stool. So why wouldn't I do it? Because it's TV? Because I'm going backwards? I don't care. No, I saw you. 
We have one more over here. Uh, what time for one last question? Yeah, Mr. Smith, congratulations. This is the billion or even trillion dollar question. Uh -oh. As a content producer, what is your view on net neutrality? <laughs> well, uh, obviously, I'm for it. Um, look, it's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question um, because everybody should have the same um, speed with which they can, they can uh, you know, access my content. Now, obviously we do a lot of video, so high bandwidth is, is very important for us. Um, you know, that said, it's, it's going to be a problem going forward because if you look at the bigger picture, you say, okay, well, the FCC gets paid by terrestrial TV. And if that market shrinks as the internet grows, then the FCC has to, by definition, regulate online because otherwise they go away. So, and then online is going to have to pay them for the privilege of being regulated. And if that is true, then by definition you're going to go forward and say, okay, well, they are going to not only regulate politically and um, socially, but they're going to regulate speed. And I think that that's, that's going to be the biggest question going forward, is not necessarily is Comcast making deals with Netflix. It's going to be the regulation of the internet as a whole, which has never really been, um, a, not, I mean, it's been a question, but it hasn't been a real question. It hasn't been a real debate. And I think that's starting now. And that's, to me, a, the bigger worry, because the, the, online, the days of the online being the Wild West are soon going to be over, I think. God help us. Um, I got one last personal curiosity. What is your secret for seducing David Carr from being a growling journalistic scold into a bromance? How did you do that? Um, well, the truth of the matter is, uh, David and I were always friends from the time. I think that when, when David stops writing will be a sad day uh, for the New York Times, but for journalism as a whole. He's one of the last great characters out there. and. Um, you know, he's a dog for the New York Times, and I'm a dog for Vice, and we go at it, and then, you know, we're buddies afterwards. He's, we hang out, and I have nothing but tremendous respect for him. Um, I have even more respect for him after he uh, uh, sort of retracted yeah. his meanness. Yeah. But I think also... Uh, <laughs> were, your, were your feelings hurt? Well, no, I'm guilty of the same thing, uh -huh. which is he had a good piece of, of, of footage. Now, you know, the one thing I will say, my defense, is when you're a young, struggling media company and everyone goes, David Carr's coming, David Carr's coming, don't fuck it up, Shane, don't fuck it up. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we had five, everyone had to be in my interview too, so oh, I'm going to come and the accountants have to come and everyone. <laughs> and so I probably would have been a little bit more of a dog for Vice if everyone hadn't been so nervous, which, is, which says something about Carr, uh, that he can make a room full of grown men nervous. But, um, you know, he's great at what he does. And they had a great piece of film that encapsulated exactly what he was saying, yep. which is, you guys are comers, I get that. He's giving us the platform and saying, we know you're coming, which is great. We're in the dialogue. We're there. We're, it's Vice and the New York Times. Who would have ever thought that? But he's saying, don't shit on us because the New York Times has been doing this a lot longer than you, which is true. true. And so I, I'm a big boy, and I, it didn't hurt my feelers. What was surprising, I was actually at the New York Times with David, and it was like every time we walked by, you guys are friends. <laughs> and, and, you know, I have tremendous respect for what he does, and the fact that he will go after you and he will say stuff. And then we'll go out afterwards and, and yep. we'll do something. I mean, too often in today's day and age where opposition research has become the sort of we're going to attack and attack and media just attacks each other and you've got op-ed hate radio on one side and comedy on the other and everyone just pointing fingers. I think people like David Carr who, who tell the truth and, 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 and aren't afraid um, you know, to speak their mind are few and far between and there should be more David Carrs going forward and not fewer. 
and I know David wished he could be here, but he's teaching in, at another school we won't mention. Uh -huh, okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just want to end with some thanks, starting with Hal Straws, who organized this event and, and did great work with the team at CUNY um, that set all this up. I want to thank the Knight Foundation, and I want to thank the Tao Foundation for making the Tao Knight, Foundation, Tao, Tao Knight Center possible, and this work in innovation. As Sarah said at the beginning, this is a school that is about innovation. If we don't innovate, we die in the field with us. So all the help you can give us in pushing us and goading us and rethinking models. And please do grab a free copy of the book on the way out and tell me what I got wrong and tell me how I didn't think far enough. And now, my friends, it's time to drink. And thank you very, very much.